So where did the whole Squaw Creek refuge and, and the wetlands associated with that come from? During the last glaciation, the wide Missouri River would roll all summer long and refreeze in the winter, and we had major dust storms. <clears throat> and because of that, we've got our, our land form, the Lus Hills, uh, that are associated with uh, Squaw Creek. Uh, this wild Missouri went back and forth. You know, it, it was known to move the channel a long ways. All right, well, Squaw Creek's located about an hour and a half north of Kansas City here, and we're about an hour and a half south of Omaha. We're right between two major urban areas. We have a lot of treasures right there in, in the Squaw Creek uh, River Valley. So these lust soils is fine uh, silt material that is windblown and stacked up. If you go to Squaw Creek's office, the hill behind it is almost 300 feet tall, and there's no rock in that. That's all silt. Uh, that landform really changes the wetlands that we have down in the bottom. Siltation is a major issue in that area and always has been. Now, Holt County is part of the Platte Purchase. We weren't part of Missouri originally. And uh, so it's a little wilder than, than we think of with other parts of the state. The Platte Purchase in Holt County wasn't actually brought, made a county until 1840. And at that point, the Missouri River was a lot further east. Uh, Forest City, which is about five miles away, actually has docks behind the main street. The post office has this funny looking deck on the back. Well, that was where they loaded barges uh, to go up the river. They reloaded uh, wood for the uh, steam engines and uh, the paddle wheelers going up and down the river. Well, as overnight, the Missouri River moved five miles from town and it really changed the whole shape of the county. In our area, the bottom, you stayed out of that. You, before we had levees, that area, it may be a river this year, it may be a cornfield next year, and, and that was a normal thing to happen. Uh, in, at Squaw Creek, we've got 7,415 acres, and we're kind of the cornerstone of the wetlands in the area. We receive a lot of media attention. We've been featured by Audubon and DU. Uh, but there's a lot of other wetlands in the valley uh, that, that make it an attractable place for wildlife. Uh, Bob Brown Conservation Area, Nottaway Valley, uh, and Turnhour, those are all areas that are managed by the Missouri Department of Conservation and have hunting. So really popular hunting areas. When you see something on Facebook or in the paper, they usually quote the Squaw Creek numbers. Well, uh, our bird numbers are published much more widely, but we don't actually have any hunting. So everybody bases their trip to the other locations off of our numbers. Uh, There's also Big Lake State Park. And that's an old oxbow that was part of the Missouri River and was cut off. Uh, it, Big Lake started in, as a state park in 1934, two years before Squaw Creek. And uh, there's actually an editorial in the St. Louis paper that said we need a national wildlife refuge here because the state park was formed. So it's kind of interesting to see how it developed <clears throat> and then how wildlife uses these areas uh, together. Uh, also have quite a few hunting pictures here. <clears throat> Squaw Creek has a lot of private wetlands around. Hunting club that some of them have been together since the 1930s. And these get passed down through generations, and these folks have come together to protect wetlands. Protect wetlands and enjoy the wetlands associated with the Missouri River. Squaw Creek, we're five miles from the river. So uh, our wetlands are a little different than you're used to seeing right up against the river, and we'll talk about that. All right, we were established in 1935, and uh, it was Franklin Delano Roosevelt that signed the executive order to form Squaw Creek. And we immediately went in and started building wetlands. Uh, the CCC and WPA both worked on the refuge. And we were just coming out of the Dust Bowl. We really needed a place for the waterfowl to migrate. And that was our key that we looked at doing. Today we have different habitats. We've got forests and we've got wetlands. <clears throat> Here's the wetlands. Uh, we're really pushing our prairies, particularly our bottomland prairies. Those bottomland prairies provide a lot of habitat. On a habitat for what we think of as upland species, 
uh, pheasant, quail, uh, the sparrows, but also in the bottom, water moves on top of the ground sometimes, and we have a whole lot of ducks that'll use it. So in the middle of the summer, you've got sparrows and quail. <clears throat> Winter time comes, get a good freeze thaw and a rain, and we've got ducks in the same same area. So pretty interesting. <clears throat> oh, and this year we will have removed all cropping from the refuge, so it will be a completely native habitat as of uh, as soon as we get the planter out there. So uh, Squaw Creek is a managed landscape. Uh, we have levees, we manipulate the water, we actively flood them and we remove the water, and we use a lot of burning. Uh, with the grasslands, that's the most efficient way to cause disturbance. Now you have to remember we're part of the Missouri River Valley and disturbance is key. That river channel moved back and forth. We had fires, uh, the scouring of those floods, uh, droughts, all those extreme actions is what made the plant communities what they are, and that's what brought wildlife. So our job is to mimic those, those actions, and fire is a big part of that. Uh, we also do a lot of restoration. We're working on our restoration right now. Just last Saturday, we planted about three acres of wildflowers and cleared some of our less hills. Uh, three weeks ago, we planted uh, 17 acres. So we've got our broadleafs out for the year. Now we're waiting for spring thaw and we'll start working on grasses. And uh, invasive species, anywhere up and down the river, uh, what anybody has on their property, that's fair game during a flood for any of the rest of us to get. So we do a lot of weed control because we want to be good neighbors and not pass those on and have the right habitat for wildlife. All right, but my favorite part of being at Squaw Creek is, is actually managing the wetlands. And uh, we do moist soil management. That's where we actively uh, add water in the fall and hold that. And then in the spring, we do timed drawdowns. Some of our units will have drawn down by mid-April. And we use that so that shorebirds can actually utilize that unit. Um, and then other units will hold water and we won't be done drawing them down till uh, mid-June. So because of that long drawdown period, we have different plants that thrive. Uh, early stuff, a lot of times your smartweed will do well. Uh, my favorite, the millet, uh, you know, about the end of May, and then just let the ground go dry and uh, hope for one June rain, and that, that gives you the perfect ticket for millet. We manage, uh, we actually pump water out of Squaw Creek, that's the, the main watershed uh, that fills the refuge. We also have Davis Creek. Most of our stuff is gravity flow, but our Mallard Marsh unit, we have to pump that. Uh, and we also have a couple places um, in the north uh, uh, woods that we have to pump for. We do a lot of mowing. We get undesirable plants and, and we can uh, control those with mowing. Think about a big flood coming through and pushing logs through. That's gonna scour the ground. And it's, it's similar um, to the effects we get. We also do a lot of disking. Uh, disking's a, a way that we can disturb the soil. We disk a little differently than farmers do. They generally disk deep and want to see black, black soil. We want to just chop up the vegetation and put just a little bit of dirt on top. And then when we add water, that gives the invertebrates a chance to get in there and uh, get things going. It doesn't always smell real good when we, uh, when we start uh, adding water in August, uh, but that breakdown encourages the invertebrates and provides a lot of food for waterfowl as it gets there later in the year. We also do spraying. Uh, you gotta be careful because we got a lot of water in the area and water moves from place to place, but uh, we do some uh, herbicide spraying to control plants like river bulrush, or uh, in some cases, even cattail uh, that can become invasive. And this is our secret weapon. When you come out to the refuge in the fall and you look for open water, we have to have a tool that we can get out there and open those areas up from major cattail infestations to, uh, to get prepared for the snow geese. And uh, these are little uh, muskrats. Uh, they're only a couple days old. We found these while we were doing some... Uh, 
some work on lease bitterns. Cute guys at that stage of life. So, uh, with all our planning and work we do, we, we, we're ready to manage our habitat, but sometimes we come out and we find this. The Missouri River still flood, and uh, even your best laid plans sometimes get changed. So, uh, you have to do the best you can and be flexible. Uh, that flooding is what made the area really strong. Um, and with Squaw Creek, we're not on the channel. When you think about floods, you see water ripping down the river, uh, moving a lot of material. We're in the backwaters, and that's what makes our wetlands different than stuff right on the main channel. Those backwaters are where the silt go, and it has time to sit and settle out. And we get a very sticky uh, mud, uh, great for getting stuck in, but uh, locally they call it gumbo. And that really tight silt mud that has settled out from flood after flood for thousands of years, that's what makes the wetlands at Squaw Creek. Uh, if you get closer to the channel, a lot of times you have sand. We don't worry about sand in our wetlands. Uh, we, can, we can disc, we can excavate them, and we've got lots and lots of this silt that we don't have to worry about poking through. And uh, that's because this water sits on Squaw Creek. Uh, another neat area that we have is the wet prairie. <clears throat> and the wet prairie at Squaw Creek is actually a thousand acres. Uh, we burned about 800 of that today. And uh, that wet prairie is the largest in the state of Missouri. Uh, that, and what happens on the wet prairie is you get sheet flow. Rain happens in the watershed, it comes down, but that really tight mud doesn't let it percolate into the soil. And because it's not percolating down, it goes right across the top. And so you get a completely different wetland type. Uh, you'll walk through in the summertime, it'll be dry. You'll take 10, 20 steps and suddenly you're ankle deep in water. You can see the wet prairie there has a couple feet of water. During 2011, we had almost four feet of water on the wet prairie for about three months. Uh, you would think this would be total devastation. Nothing is going to survive this. We were ready for the worst. But actually afterwards, we had an amazing amount of sedges and wildflowers and that came up and we had a really healthy looking prairie. All the reed canary grass and our invasives, they didn't make it through the flood. Now over time they came back, but... Uh, Flooding is part of the ecosystem and what this area is used to. Uh, you'll also notice our moist soil units and our teal pool unit. These areas have bare soil. Uh, we do that by putting that water on and leaving it on all winter. It kills out all the vegetation, lets everything break down. If we don't think it's going to break down, we'll go in there and disc it and disturb it. All right, we do have a little bit of flooded timber. Uh, our rain cycle really isn't uh, right for that. Generally, for your flooded timber, we would have to have our rains come in December, January, February in our dormant season. Most of our rains come in September and October, and then again in March, April, and May. And so uh, we've got a little bit of this managed, but we're really not in the area for having uh, flooded timber. And we also have our big, at the bottom there, our uh, big pools, Eagle Pool and Pelican Pool. And then you have a constant fight with your American Lotus. Everybody likes a little American Lotus. It's a beautiful flower, but it doesn't have a lot of wild wildlife food value. So we don't want to have a thousand acres of it. We'll, we'll take a hundred, but not a thousand. All right. So this is what we see this time of year. Everything's had a time to break down. We've got a lot of water and we're waiting for the wildlife to come back, uh, coming out of the dormant season here. Uh, a lot of disturbance. If you have a leak in one of your units, you start seeing that disturbance still. You can find your disc marks from uh, last summer. And we manage large units and small units. In, our in the top here, uh, that's our Bigelow unit. That's actually an old agricultural field. We remove some of the dirt, uh, graded it out, and it's about a 35-acre unit that we provide for, for waterfowl and a few shorebirds, but uh, in a dry year, 
we can't get water in that unit. There's not enough water coming down the ditch to flood that. So we have to be a little opportunistic. Uh, you hit your, make sure your larger pools, your eagle, your pelican, cattail pool, uh, pintail, make sure they have water every year. And then in good years when we have a lot of water in the area, we, we access some of these other units. Uh, here we've got uh, some button bush. Um, again, it's a native species, but it can be uh, invasive. And so in our management, what we'll do is actually just raise the water in the summertime and we can actually uh, subdue it a little bit. We don't want to completely kill it, but we don't want a solid mat where nothing else can, can, uh, can survive. All right. Uh, now, I've been talking a little bit about it. We've got some millet up here. We've got a lot of wildlife that need to use these units. Ducks, and we've actually got a lot of otters in the area now too. So a uh, little rough on fishing, but, uh, but they're a cool critter to take pictures of. When you think about Squaw Creek and the wildlife, everybody thinks about the deer. We had a very high deer population and no hunts were done on the refuge from 1935 until 1988. And in that time, the population exploded. Uh, so we're a very popular place to, to look at deer. And uh, we've been able to pull that population down to healthier numbers. And hopefully uh, we'll be able to, to maintain it at that level. Coyotes, uh, if you're out on the refuge very long, you will hear coyotes any any time after about three o'clock. They start howling and barking. So uh, neat animal. A lot of times people don't don't see these guys. Uh, and we also have the prairie rattlesnake. Uh, we used to call it the eastern Massasauga rattlesnake. It became the western Massasauga. Now the population that we have at Squaw Creek, eh, it's kind of on its own. It's it's been called the prairie rattlesnake. So. Uh, a neat guy about 24 inches long and they rely on that wet prairie. Uh, one of the things when we had the 2010 and 2011 flood, there was concern that these guys would disappear. I mean, their habitat was underwater for four months, but uh, they did great, came back and uh, they've been through this before. So, but they're a, a wetland obligate species because they actually hibernate by going down into crayfish burrows. So you have to have crayfish in your prairie so the snakes have a place to hibernate. All right, so those are some of our um, species that don't migrate. This winter, we've had some cold times and a lot of our critters, uh, they migrate like the mallards. Uh, Squaw Creek's known for having up to about 150,000 mallards uh, in the peak migration in the fall. In the fall migration, we see animals come down, particularly the birds, and they stay. And they don't want to leave until there's a major weather event that's going to push them out. In the springtime, everybody needs to get up north and nest. So, and we don't necessarily see the real high peaks in numbers. For most of our ducks, but they come through. They'll stay for a few days and move on. And the mallard's one of those, one of those species. Ah, and we also have the lesser snow goose. Now, completely different than the mallard. They come down in the fall, and we'll get up to 300, maybe 400,000 lesser snow geese in the fall. In the springtime, they're moving back north, but they push up against an ice line. There seems to be a weather pattern where every year there's a, a line of ice, and it moves north very slowly, and the snow geese follow right behind that. Uh, in the peak, we've had 1.7 million snow geese on the refuge. Now, they also use the other wetlands around us, so it's quite loud at night uh, as the snow geese are, are coming in. Now, we don't hunt the snow goose on Squaw Creek, but once they leave, they're hunted in the farm fields. And uh, the hunting community really wants the refuge quiet and protected. They don't want them disturbed. That's where the, that's their refuge, their true refuge, so that it provides opportunities all over northwest Missouri. One way that we get to that 1.7 million is because of where we're located. We're right along the Missouri River in the valley, but birds migrate 
through flyways. We have the Mississippi Flyway that follows the Mississippi and Missouri River. And then as you move west into Kansas, Nebraska, you have the Central Flyway. So you'll see where Squaw Creek is right here. We've got actually one group coming down here and then going out of Louisiana, coming back up to Squaw Creek. And there's also a group in the Central Flyway coming down this side and going back. So both of those migratory uh, waterfowl or um, flyways mix and meet at Squaw Creek. If you think about an hourglass, there's that pinch point. We're kind of the pinch point in that hourglass of their migration route. And that's one way that we get so many birds at Squaw Creek. Okay, so the bald eagle, we see about uh, 400 of those at a peak migration. In the springtime, we don't see that many, but, uh, but they're moving through quickly, heading for their nesting grounds. One of the smaller birds we get is the short-eared owl. And uh, you see these particularly on the wet prairie. A lot of people haven't spent the time out there to see them. Uh, about the last 45 minutes of sunlight uh, from late November to early February, these guys will be out hunting uh, rabbits, mice, and voles out of our wet prairie. And they're just beautiful to watch soar uh, silently across the, uh, the wet prairie. You can actually go in the north woods and just find an opening and look south, and they're there pretty much every night hunting. And uh, so there's a lot of pieces of the ecology we have to have. Uh, you know, not only the plants, but the animals, the mice are important to draw these short-eared owls down. And uh, a lot of people don't, don't take the time to, to check these guys out. But if you've got a quiet afternoon in, in December, stop and, uh, stop and check them out. The Sandhill Crane. The Sandhills aren't in a lot of places in Missouri. Uh, generally, we think about them in Water Basin in Nebraska and going up and down that central flyway. But over the last uh, about eight years, we've started seeing more sandhill cranes. This fall, we actually had 24 sandhill cranes that were utilizing our wetlands in December. Uh, we think we've got two nesting pairs on the refuge. But remember I showed you those pictures of those coyotes? We see the young, and they get about... 20 inches tall, and then we don't see them anymore. So we think they're probably somebody's lunch. Least bittern, we talked a little bit about our plants and how we manage our wetlands. We generally leave eagle pool and pelican pool and uh, pintail pool fully flooded. That way you've got good cattail populations for this guy, the least bittern. What they'll do is they'll actually fold the cattail leaves down and make a little bowl nest. And to manage for this species, I want to have 28 inches of water in cattails. that's open enough that they can dive down and get fish. <clears throat> They're a fish eating bird. So you'll have one unit where you've got your cattails that are too thick. The least bitterns can't get, get to the food source. In the next unit, your cattail isn't thick enough because they don't have, they're not close enough to fold and make nests. So it's a constant back and forth trying to kill the cattail out and then trying to, to get it to grow in another unit. Uh, but they're really worth it. Uh, they've actually, we've had 100 uh, nests recorded on the refuge before. This last year, we just had five. So it's a, the population tends to go up and down, and hopefully we can get that on an upward swing. Uh, another species we see a lot of the times this year is the trumpeter swan. I've been at Squaw Creek for 11 years, and my first year there, we had three trumpeter swans. And I remember everybody got so excited, we sent news releases out that we had trumpeter swans on the refuge. This uh, January, we had 512. Uh, so this species has been in recovery mode. There, there's a lot of uh, work being done in Wisconsin and Minnesota and Iowa in the prairie potholes to, to get better nesting habitat. And all that work, we're seeing that we're reaping the rewards of that <clears throat> at Squaw Creek as we see more and more of them. Uh, this is actually the largest waterfowl species in North America. And uh, they've got about an eight foot wingspan. So if you're out working in the wetland and you get to have one pass right over you, 
It kind of gets dark for just a minute as it goes over. Massive, massive bird. So come up, check them out. Now, we, when we think about migrants, we usually think about birds and, and bats and bigger animals, but we also have the monarchs. Uh, we talked about that wet prairie. Having the, the water in the spring and then drying out and that constantly changing encourages this plant, uh, Bidens. And in the fall, you'll see all these Bidens growing on our levee sides and across the wet prairie. And about middle of September, the monarchs show up. And uh, we've been able to tag close to 300 monarchs in a year on Squaw Creek. Uh, we also plant milkweed. Uh, that's one of our interns' jobs is to collect the intern, uh, the uh, milkweed seed. Uh, they come back and everything they have is just fluffy. But uh, we send them out anyway, and uh, and we're seeing more and more habitat that's that's really suitable for the monarch butterfly. And there's uh, that's actually a candidate species now. So we're really managing to improve habitat for the monarch. Uh, wildflowers, we've got to have some pollinators out there. We've got to have things besides just nesting habitat. Uh, we do a lot with common milkweed. We've planted about uh, four acres of that this weekend. Uh, lead plant, this would be a plant up in those Lus Hills. I told you that it was a fine, silty material. Uh, because of that silt, when it rains, it uh, runs off. We get a lot of siltation into our wetlands. But we also have plants that you don't see in other places. It's really Missouri's only short grass prairie. Uh, you don't see have grasses that are six feet tall. There's not enough water to, to let them do that. Uh, you may have big blue stem up there that's, that's only three or in a good year, four feet tall. Uh, but you get a lot of your short grasses like your side oats grama. Purple coneflower. In our area, we've got some really dark purple that comes out. And so it's, uh, it's just different. You can see if somebody's restoring a, a, a wildflower unit, putting wildflowers into a prairie, and the neighbor didn't, the neighbor's is a much deeper purple. So uh, that's kind of how we check out who's using local seed and collecting their own and who's just buying it. Uh, dotted Blazing Star. We have about uh, 15 acres of this that we're able to grow and we're introducing that into our wet prairie to diversify that thousand acres of wet prairie. Now, if you're into uh, raising wildflowers and you have a lot of deer around, you got to have a, a tool that's going to help you do that. And uh, <clears throat> this New England aster, we planted it and planted it and planted it, and the deer love it. Uh, so this has been a challenge to raise this one. We usually use some other plants to, uh, to, that are really bristly uh, to keep to protect it. But uh, it's a late season plant, and it really likes those wet prairie sites. If you get an area that actually floods out, this would be a good candidate to put in there. Uh, and in our Lus Hills, we've got the silverleaf serralia. Uh, this grows only in the Lus Hills and it, the leaves are actually silver. If you want to survey for it, you can hike up and down the Lus Hills and, and spend a lot of energy on a hot summer day. Or there's a period, about the third week of June, you can simply drive the highways, and you see the silver spots, uh, and you can just about you know draw them in on a map from that. So really neat plant. The thing is, you got to come different times of the year. Come see our waterfowl. Come see our the swans and the, uh, the sandhill cranes, but come back in the summer and check out some of these plants. Um, purple prairie clover, it's one of the first uh, wildflowers to, to bloom in the fall, and uh, it's a great, great time to come up, you know, usually about the first of July. Ah, springtime, we got to start thinking about the thaw and the morel mushrooms. Uh, we actually open at Squaw Creek for mushroom hunting from uh, April 15th through about May 20th. And uh, actually the Lus Hills, everything east of Highway 159 is open. And that's a chance to explore some areas that you can't get to otherwise. Um, but the morel mushroom is a tasty uh, mushroom. And uh, come out and collect and, and have a, a fine dinner that night. Okay, uh, to help you get in and out, 
Squaw Creek is closed and less open, so we've got a couple trails. We've got the uh, Callow Trail, which is actually uh, wheelchair accessible. We've got the uh, Lus Hills Trail, which is nine-tenths of a mile, and it goes up these stone stairs here that were laid by the CCC, and about 300 feet. And then we've also got the Henry Munkers Trail, which is our newest trail, and it's about a mile and a half long and uses these same stone steps and takes you over to an old farmstead and back on uh, down, the, uh, down the old highway. Uh, we have one trail in the river bottom to explore the wetlands, and that's our Eagle Overlook Trail. So it's right down at the top of one of our management levees. You see everything that we're doing on that unit while you hike that trail. Uh, biking and running on the, on the roadway, we've got an auto tour route that's 10 miles, and uh, it's usually a good place for biking, um, and we even get some runners out there. 10-mile uh, run's a little much for me, though. All right, and if you're interested, come out to one of our special events. We do different events through the year. The big ones that uh, we do is our Eagle Days. Uh, we've actually had 36 Eagle Days. We started there in 1978, and... Uh, now we see uh, five to 7,000 people most years. So it's a really exciting time to celebrate eagles and their habitat in the wetlands. And Squaw Creek's a great place to do that because you can access the wetlands. So many wetlands you visit, you have to wear waders, and you're either going to get cold or get mosquito bites in the process. But you can visit it from the comfort of your car and, uh, and experience the, the wetlands while you're there. All right.